joining me. I have Ted Zeroni with me this morning, who you're likely already familiar with. I see some people are having audio issues. Everything's good on uh, my end. And the only suggestion I have is to um, leave and join again. It looks like most people or some people for sure can hear me. So um, that's my best troubleshooting tip. Uh, would be to leave and join again. I have come across Chrome updates being an issue if you happen to be joining from the browser. Um, so if you're not using the Zoom client installed on your computer and you've clicked that join with browser button, that can cause issues, especially if Chrome gets out of date um, and they are rolling out updates on that quite frequently these days. So that's something you could try to as an update there. Um, if you have the option to join from the Zoom client, um, the actual installed software on the computer instead, it tends to always run a little bit more stable too. And I see Teresa has suggested that there, you may have missed a pop-up that you have to allow the computer audio. So uh, on that little lock at the left-hand end of your address bar when you're on your browser, if you click on there, make sure that it is allowing access also to audio and things in there. So. There's some troubleshooting tips for those who are having audio. It is 8.32, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. I will, once again, because I see our participant number has increased immensely since I said good morning the first two times. So good morning. My name is Angela Deering, and you are all attending my very first um, consortia live session. I work for Wetaskiwin Regional Schools, uh, just in between Edmonton and Red Deer, if you're not familiar with where we are. And I'm a part of the Central Alberta Regional Consortia. Very new member signed on in the spring to help out with computer science. Uh, so I've been working through some videos and helping Ted and Chris with some of the live sessions and uh, the other online sessions that they've done regarding the science curriculum. And my role is to talk computer science and to make connections into computer science for you teachers and making those connections into the other curriculum areas and helping uh, ed tech leaders help teachers in their divisions with computer science and all of that good stuff. In Wetaskiwin Regional, I'm an ed tech lead and I've been doing lots of CS uh, we call it coding, STEM, STEAM, robotics for the last 10 years or so in my division. And I'm really excited to be helping with the provincial committee with this curriculum rollout and supporting teachers all across Alberta with this new computer science rollout. I am one of those people, and you may have people in your division also who do the same thing, who has been trying to get teachers to do some computer science in addition to all of the other curriculum and things that you're expected to cover in a day. I'm really fortunate here in Wetaskiwin to have some some really great teachers who allow me to come in and help them roll this, this stuff out. So I was really excited when I saw computer science rolling out in our science curriculum. I think it's about time that there is an expectation that teachers are giving these skills to students. And we know that technology is not going anywhere. And the kids that we're teaching today are growing up into a world that we really can't even anticipate what it looks like. Um, and these kids are going to grow up and have jobs that don't even exist today using technology that hasn't been invented yet. So education um, today is so much different than it's ever been. And technology is advancing so quickly. It's really hard as educators to to get ahead of that. So today we're going to take a look at the whole computer science curriculum. I am looking at kindergarten through grade six because we have lots of teachers optionally implementing. And, and if you are a grade four, five, six teacher, I'm sure you are just as curious as the ones rolling out here in September as to what's coming down the pipe. And I just will start off by saying that you're going to be very happy to learn that especially in division one, that you're probably actually already covering um, a lot of the outcomes that are in your computer science, just with what's happening in your classrooms. So I don't see it as too overwhelming and I hope that you don't either. Uh, we will have a look together. I'm gonna start with first 
a quick land acknowledgement. In the spirit of reconciliation, we want to acknowledge that this gathering is taking place on traditional lands across the province of Alberta, home to many diverse First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. We acknowledge that this land is a traditional meeting ground giving voice to its original peoples and the story of creation of this country in a way that history has forgotten. So likely you have already had a look uh, at the new curriculum rolling out ELA and math last year, potentially you're getting prepared for the new year coming up and looking at the things that are coming out for your grade. So you may have also attended sessions already through consortia where you've really broken down what the architecture of the curriculum looks like and how we have, you know, those organizing ideas that filter down into those cusps and we've got guiding questions. So just the, the computer science is one of those organizing ideas in your science. It's organized in the same way. It starts in kindergarten all the way through grade six, which I think is something really lovely with the new science curriculum in that students are going to cover on these key topics each year. And those skills are always building up. Computer science is the same way. Let's see if this is going to play automatically. So with that organizing idea at the top for kindergarten through grade six, the computer science organizing idea is that problem solving and scientific inquiry are developed through the knowledgeable application of creativity, design, and computational thinking. And then beyond there, of course, we see our learning outcomes breaking out grade by grade. So starting, of course, at the kindergarten level, we're looking actually at just interpreting instructions in the learning environment. And then it continues on uh, up through the grades, getting obviously more complicated and seeing more language that we would attribute traditionally to computer science. So you'll notice right away that in division one, we're seeing a lot about instructions. And it's not until we get into grade three that we see computational thinking. And then through grade four, five, and six, we're actually talking into that computer science language. We're having students doing some block-based programming as referenced there. And that is that sort of trajectory. Oh, it's going to play on me again. So this is just a overarching look at all of those learning outcomes. So this is the whole computer science curriculum learning outcome from K through six with that guiding question at each grade and then also that learning outcome. And I've just highlighted um, some of the key words that we see coming up continually throughout the curriculum. So early in, oh, someone says their slides aren't changing. Is anybody else seeing that issue? We should be looking at a at a graph uh, at a it change. Okay, so we must just have some lag there. My goodness, it's not a good technical morning. So with the um, learning outcomes, as I say, I've just highlighted some words out here that you can see instructions comes up a lot in kindergarten and grade one. And then we start to see creativity popping up a lot in grade two and three. We're looking at design in grade four and five and then continuing into grade six. And that's where we see this abstraction popping up. So I think um, this is not overly intimidating, even if you're a, a grade six teacher and you're looking at all of the, the gaps from the years that the students didn't have this new curriculum, I think it's still not as intimidating to cover these early things because even though you may not have been explicitly talking about instructions in reference to computer science or, or the, the lower grade teachers hadn't been, it's easy to make quick connections to those things. So I'm going to show you some ways that I think you can easily make up those gaps. And for the, the, the division one teachers, how you can easily cover what is expected in your curriculum and even beyond to give your students a really solid foundation in those coding and computational thinking skills that we know are just going to benefit them in their futures. So as I already mentioned, depending where you're at, the kindergarten teachers uh, probably aren't bridging as many gaps, obviously, as the grade six teachers have to bridge. I know it's 
probably incredibly overwhelming when you look at the scope of the whole new curriculum that you're rolling in and how many gaps there actually are. But again, computer science is the one place that I think that those gaps are the easiest to cover. So as a grade four teacher, when you're coming in and you look at, you know, your grade four outcome and start to get into the knowledge and the skills and procedures in there, you're going to find things that you maybe need to go back and cover some language, some vocabulary or some content from the lower grades. And that will be um, easy enough for you to do, as I say, because it's all really easily connected into what you're doing in your classroom procedures. So let's uh, jump in to the actual curriculum documents a bit. I'm not going to cover each grade in quite as much detail as what we're going to just have a quick look at kindergarten. So this is just a more to have a look at the overall structure of what these look like. That looks uh, very similar to all of the other new curriculum. Uh, we've, I've of course got the guiding question and the learning outcome at the top. And then we have the cusps of uh, breaking down, showing what students specifically need to be able to do uh, and what they are supposed to know. They, there is a lot of knowledge in certain parts of the computer science curriculum. In particular, grade two, um, don't, when the grade two teachers hit theirs, I, I have to, it actually has to go over two slides because there's just so much knowledge in there. And this might be one of those places, uh, depending particularly as we start to get up into four, five, and six, if you haven't done um, any coding, you're not familiar with coding yourself and teaching it, that this may be where there's a little bit more knowledge that you're not familiar with, where you'll see terms and concepts coming up that, you know, they're not things that we learned in school, because this has all been invented since we were in school. So there's a little bit more knowledge in places, but starting out early on, for sure, for kindergarten and grade one and grade two, we're really using language that we're using all the time. So instructions is highlighted several times on the kindergarten graphic. We see it popping up in the knowledge. It comes up also in the understandings parts. And there's the skills and procedures too, where we're, we're expecting students to be able to recognize when actions do not correspond to instructions or match an action to a corresponding instruction. Moving up through into grade one, we see the same. We're still dealing with instructions and what it means to follow instructions. Starting in grade two, we can still see that instructions is a piece of this. So this is one of those pieces where if you're a grade two teacher, uh, we might have to have some conversations about how instructions are like coding and computational thinking and the things that computers follow, you'll notice that computers, robots, coding doesn't actually come up in the language of this curriculum at all. If I was in the classroom, however, I would be introducing that language along with this language right from the beginning that you don't have to assess the students on whether they know what an algorithm is, for example, but telling them that sets of instructions can also be called algorithms right away in kindergarten is giving them those skills and helping them develop the concepts and the knowledge that they'll need so that when they get to grade six and they're actually expected to use a block-based programming language to create some type of artifact, right away from kindergarten, they already knew what an algorithm was moving up. And the def definition of algorithm, which I do have uh, later on in the slides too, when we get a little bit more hands-on with activities, um, the, the def this most simple definition of algorithm is that it is a set of instructions. So where we see um, instructions throughout the kindergarten, grade one, grade two, computer science curriculum, um, we, can use the word algorithm with students and start putting that language, that computer science language in. So that's where that connection is. They're really simplifying it because that is what computer coding is, is just writing sets of instructions. So right away early on in the lower grades, we're getting students to understand what following instructions means. We ask them to do things in their daily routines, but we maybe don't say these are your instructions and this is what you do when you follow them. So it's really going to just be drawing attention to when we're following instructions. So moving along, see here's that grade two that I referenced with all of the knowledge. I even had to make the font very small on this slide so that all of that content content would 
fit. Remember that with the knowledge, this is meant to support you in getting the students to be able to do what is in the skills and procedures. And it's really, you know, the understanding that one liner is what the students are expected to know. So I look at when I see this as an advantage, grade two teachers, that they've given you a lot of content um, to work with in trying to meet the understanding and the skills and procedures. It is not an expectation for the most part that all of the knowledge is being directly instructed to students or assessed. And you can, if you, um, in Ted's session on Monday, he talked about the language and they talked specifically about how sometimes it may say such as so that is not a requirement right if it's saying that there's I don't oh there is one here but I skipped so this one here many people can create instructions such as and they've given us a list of people who might make instructions such as means we might have different things that we would add into that knowledge depending on our students they may or may not connect to what's listed as a such as and we may have ideas of other things that would fit in there and then when we look at one like this one that says including now we're talking about we want to cover these three concepts under here form order and clarity are a piece of communicating instructions and it says including so with the knowledge like I say grade two lots of knowledge we still see instructions coming up over and over again here that's that algorithm thinking that connects into computer coding and we're starting to see a little bit about designing instructions although not in as it pertains to the design process quite yet as we move into grade three Big word computational starts to come up. We're going to talk in depth about what computational thinking is and how you are already doing it with your students and easy ways that you can make connections to it uh, within your science lessons, but also throughout your daily lessons and classroom routines. Lots of creativity popping up in grade three as well. And I'm going to talk about the creativity as it pertains to science and computer science more specifically in a little bit here two. So just jumping into as we hit grade four, five and six, for those of you who are uh, optionally implementing, or maybe you're looking at this a whole year out. Um, this is where it does start to get a little bit deeper where we are going to probably be using some type of student devices and having kids do some um, coding, whether it be in an app like Scratch or creating um, something with micro bits or some other type of coding technology. We see Artifact coming up here in grade four, which I have not highlighted, but uh, important piece as Artifacts will be referenced throughout the next three grades. Um, and then moving again into grade five, grade four and five look a lot alike. We're just delving deeper into that computational thinking, starting to see design cropping up as an idea as well. And then moving into grade six is all about design. So by the grade six level, um, we really want them to use all of those skills that they've learned along the way. They've learned to build algorithms, though we may haven't been expected to call them that. Again, I would encourage you to use to go ahead and use that computer language when you're talking with your students about it too. And some more grade six, again, with the computational and design, the end goal grade six, this matters for everybody. You, you want to know where the students are expected to go. At the end of grade six, computer science students are expected to create something that could be, as I say, it could be a micro bit project. It might be a project in an app like Scratch, but something, some type of um, computer or technology or robotic project where they have used a block based programming language. Everything we're doing from kindergarten um, and up to that point is getting them to just making things with a block-based programming language. It's a good chance um, many of you are already 
using some block-based programming in your classes with your students. There are great resources online that I'll share at the end of the presentation that can get you started. Um, I would encourage you, no matter what grade, uh, even kindergarten, we're just following instructions. If we have some opportunity to embed the actual coding into that learning as well, that's going to just benefit your students in the future. The easiest way to start teaching your students about computer science is to embed it into your classroom routines. I'm not sure I'd use the kid bots um, I'm going to, I'm, I'm just reading a question. I will save questions. Ted is here and he's going to help me out with questions. Um, I'll maybe break partway through for some. And then if I don't, I think I probably will end up answering this one as we move um, a little bit further into the presentation today. So do put your questions in the chat. I may not answer them right in the moment, but um, thank you so much for, for putting that in and I'll, I'll do my best to cover that as we go along. So Starting out kindergarten, you are going to be doing computer science, grade one's doing computer science, and we have, you know, those bits of instruction. So I, I like kinder bots for kindergarten specifically, or I'll use kid bots for the little guys. And when I say I, this is, I go out and roll steam out in our division with the, the little people. So this is something I've used with students that works really well. And it's a great way just to connect in. So if you set up, you know, on your first day, you're giving your students sort of their their classroom routines. This is what I want you guys to do when you come in in the morning. And, you know, we give them a set of instructions. Bringing the computer science piece in is just as simple as asking students to repeat back those instructions and having conversations. Well, why, why do we leave our outside shoes in the boot room? And having a conversation about that piece of instruction. And right there, you are teaching students how to interpret those instructions. And they are giving them back to you. So they are showing you that they're understanding them. And then maybe we do, you know, the come in, this is our first instruction. Now we're going to work on our next routine, what happens at lunchtime. And we could have a conversation. All right, you guys, you are going to be my little robots. This morning, I taught you your very first program. Do you know what a program is? And you know, had this conversation, a program is how a computer or a robot or a machine knows what to do. It's just the same as us. When I gave you those instructions for what you do when you come in in the mornings, I gave you a program. And just like a robot, now you know that program. And every time you come to school, you know to just complete that program because I've given you that algorithm, that set of instructions. Let's work together to come up with a set of instructions for what we do when the lunchtime bell rings. And now we're going to build instructions together. And again, if we just reference that they are like the robots and we need to make a put now when a new student comes to our class, we can just give them these algorithms and they will be programmed right away to be a new student in our class and they'll know all of the routines that we are doing. So same thing when it comes to learning instructions, you've taught your students how to do some, you know, basic um, adding, say in math, turning around and asking them to feed you, but what, what are the, what are the steps? How would you tell a robot or how would you tell someone who doesn't know how to add to do that process? And let's work through those steps together. And definitely with the little people um, and in the beginning, we're probably going to be having a lot of these conversations, you know, as a whole group, because this will be new to them. They're used to adults saying, boom, 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 here's your instructions, you follow them. So having the students, you know, sort of get involved in designing the instructions might be a little bit different and they might not come up with the greatest instructions right off the bat. But if you start those, those processes with them right away and have those conversations, oh, we're having a fire drill today. Kid bots, what's the algorithm for a fire drill? And then, you know, we can, and you can even get deeper. We talk about, if we were talking about the fire drill example, when the fire bell rings, that is our 
our starting moment for our algorithms. What makes the algorithm start? And we can compare that to, that's similar to, do you notice when I pick my phone up, the screen lights up? Hmm, that's interesting. That must be an algorithm in the phone. That's just like when I hear the fire bell, boom, my algorithm starts to run. So you can make those connections into lessons, things that the students have been taught, asking them to repeat back the instructions, whether it be specifically for a little robot that you have in the class, and they can tell you that it moved a certain way, or they're giving you back those instructions for the fire drill, or what we do at assembly time. We're working with that algorithmic thinking, and just embedding that into everything that we're doing. And we can make connections to things outside of school too, to go even deeper with the students into what this designing instructions means. So we follow, are there other places in life that we follow? Who makes up instructions in the world? And, you know, maybe we think the police do and we have a conversation about you know well the governments or the decision makers and who makes who decides the instructions for the fire drill did I decide those and you know have the conversation that the principal makes those instructions so we can have lots of conversations about algorithms and computational thinking and just talking about everyday ordinary things having students talk about their process at home. What's your bedtime procedure? What, what is a kid bought? What's your algorithm for going to bed? And then having them share and show that, hmm, your algorithm looks very different from your algorithm. Is it possible to have two different sets of instructions that end up at the same outcome? And we see that coming up in the curriculum as we're moving up through the grades. I don't wanna say specifically what grade they're talking about, but I think it's very early on that we wanna recognize that we can, you know, we can get to bed by following two completely different paths. And at the end of the day, our outcome going to bed is achieved for, for us no matter what our path is. So that is um, my, my biggest tip with computer science, coding, computational thinking, um, just generally getting kids thinking critically about uh, how we're breaking things down and putting instructions together. Tell them on the first day of school that this year, they're all your little bots. Um, you can use hand signals and verbal signals. Maybe we flip the lights off and we can have conversations about how instructions can be given in different ways. That's another one of the skills and procedures that you see popping up that Oh, look at if I put my hand up like this, you all know to do this algorithm, but we have say the fire alarm is a different type of sound. That's something that we hear. Isn't it interesting that we can receive instructions in different ways, like those Ikea instructions that are really hard to put together. Um, instructions can be clear um, and the more clear they are, the easier they are to follow. So this can all just connect into what you're doing every day. Now, to get just, I'm a little bit deeper, more specific. I, um, if you have, I, I have some other videos and things that are floating out on the consortia site. So you may have seen this um, graphic from me before. So if you do get onto some of the connections videos, uh, since I'm talking about them right now, I will just make a a very quick reference. So Ted and Chris are doing a series of sessions uh, on each of the organizing ideas, and that some are in live uh, for the their, for school divisions with their particular consortia, and others have been virtual. And I'm working on creating short videos that go along with those. So in the matter area of the consortia site, if if you were to track down um, the matter sessions that were done last spring, there's videos there where I'm connecting in for each grade. And in those videos, I also have this graphic. However, it was created uh, on a version of the science curriculum that was a whole year old. And it was really interesting to me last night when I redid this bubble, how much um, the draft curriculum changed to the implementation curriculum. So this is all of the knowledge in the K to six computer science curriculum popped out into this word bubble. And as my first half hour has been mostly about 
you can see instructions pops up as like the single biggest used word in knowledge. And then we see creativity and design. I, I think it, I didn't go through and, and, and remove the, the words that like can. So look at how big can is popping up. But I liked that there because um, the curriculum is talking about what students can do and that's coming up a lot and then technology um, is not as big as you might expect it to be in a computer science curriculum computers isn't very big in here either although code does pop up and that brings me to this this is the organizing idea whether you're teaching kindergarten or grade six the organizing idea refers to creativity design and computational thinking those three key pieces are woven throughout the curriculum. And the end game by grade six is that students are, of course, using creativity, but they're applying design thinking and computational thinking to creating that artifact or that project that we're going to be having them doing. So let's talk a bit about those three things and how they can connect into your computer sciences, your science and your other subject areas as well. So creativity isn't something new to you or I, though it can be um, a very obscure idea. When we're talking about creativity in, in as it pertains to computer science, I've actually pulled this definition right out of the grade three knowledge piece. So according to the grade three curriculum, creativity involves divergent thinking and can be used to develop different ways to achieve the same outcome. And creativity involves imagination, observation, and making connections. So I like to present creativity to students in that just thinking of new ways to get to the same place or to achieve the same outcome. It also means being able to think about how to do something that's maybe not working out well or using creative thinking to solve a problem. Can we, this isn't working. Can we think of a different way to do this so that this will work or so that we can achieve this outcome? So applying creativity in computer science um, is really just about problem solving and critical thinking and being willing to look for new ways to get to the same place. I uh, A colleague shared, a, a, it was actually a, a very old handout that she had come across in her collection of what makes a good scientist. And I thought it was a really great graphic. Um, this, I wanted to use it specifically for some STEAM things that I was doing with students. Something that I've learned with the creativity and also as we get into design thinking is students aren't um, inherently prepared to fail and they don't do very well um, with failure and often when they meet failure, the, the last thing they want to do is go back and try again and not fail. So I think that creativity piece really ties into that and, and that we have to, and even as adults, I think as a teacher person, um, we're not always prepared to meet failure either. And if you've ever tried to do a little bit of coding yourself or tried to um, follow along and build like a scratch project, and then you, you met some issues along the way, coding is very, very much about um, trial and error. And we need to teach uh, students how to do trial and error. They are not okay with error. Uh, in particular, your high flyers, you guys will definitely can have copies of all of this for sure. I'm just catching that in the chat. And I even have um, to be, uh, we have, I have some inclusivity as well. So there's three different versions in the slideshow here that you're definitely more than welcome to have. And these are um, great for signs. I think great actually for general, just, you know, being a creative thinker with Computer sciences, um, and when I do STEAM stuff, I really talk engineering with the students. I want them to aim for the, the stars, right? So um, I might say, you know, scientists or engineers, and then the, the piece 
for sure that that I'm referring to here is the you know the curious mind and then the strong heart and talking about failure and that you can go ahead and try something and it doesn't work out and you know that's okay from it not working out you have learned something and now you can go back and you can try again and the second time is going to be better so that's a a piece of that creativity that I think um really specifically ties into the design thinking and computer science we can definitely get the poster in French as well I don't have it yet but I have I have a person all right that's creativity so that was that first key piece of the computer science um we have students doing creative thinking again. This might be happening in computer science, but don't um, be shy to connect this into other things. So if we're trying to problem solve in math and students have gotten the wrong answer, we can have that conversation. Let's be creative. Is there another way that we could go about this? And we could just have that conversation and without explicitly saying we're doing computer science now you are covering and giving the kids skills concepts you're reinforcing the ideas that you're doing in computer science so design thinking uh big big overarching idea depending on how you google it up you might see you know a variety of steps or different terminologies for what design thinking is this is what uh, i've chosen i used the design thinking process a lot with grade six classes doing some robotics camps and it's always a challenge and it doesn't really say anywhere in the curriculum that your students need to be able to explain the design thinking process. We're really looking for students to be showing us that they're using the design thinking process and, and particular pieces of it are referenced throughout the curriculum. So I think this is something that certainly early on, you're not explicitly going to talk to your kindergarten kids about Today, kids, we're going to do some design thinking, but you definitely may start to cover these pieces and might explicitly talk about, for example, empathizing. Hello, I'm Mark. And I'm Murray. Just and we're here. Actually, not going to play the video. Um, so empathy, when I, again, all, all years doing many, many STEAM camps with grade six students, empathy was a piece that I would spend quite a bit of time actually working on with the students at the beginning of, of STEAM camp, not because, not because students don't empathize. Well, I mean, but they don't necessarily haven't, back off, they haven't necessarily been taught what empathizing means. And we would probably think that empathy connects more into, you know, our health, or I guess it would be our pew uh, curriculum now, because we're talking about feelings and, and thinking about other people. But the, as far as it goes with the design process, we have to be able to put ourselves in someone else's shoes, if we're going to be designing things for them. So with the little guys, it's, it's often when they're creating projects or things, they're going to be very self centric with that. Um, they're going to be creating something they would like or designing or imagining something that 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 meets their needs. So learning about empathy, and how not only can you, you know, care or feel how another person feels and understand that as far as it relates to the design process, it's really about just understanding your audience. So if you've been asked um, to create, say, a new playground for the school, like we're going to do a project in our building unit, and we're going to design a playground for the school. Let's start out by, hmm, who's going to be using our playground? And say we're grade is a grade two doing building now we're in grade two well we have to think about who else uses the playground and how can we think about what did you like when you were in kindergarten it's always a great place to start with the empathy connection is to ask students to design something for younger people because that's an easy connection to go back and say you know I know you probably don't like Paw Patrol anymore but what do you think about the kindergarten kids? What do you think they're into? Do you remember? And can you make those connections? And then asking students, how do you think it would feel to be this other person? So that's like a big piece, I think, with um, 
the design process that you can start early on. Again, I'm not going to be talking to kindergarten kids about how we're doing design thinking today, but we might watch this lovely video of Mark Ruffalo and one of the Sesame Street gang talking about empathy and just have a conversation about that. And it's not only going to build into their computer science and design thinking, it's also going to hopefully help them be, you know, good social citizens and, and, and great classmates as well. So again, I'm not going to show this video now and the version of the slides that we're going to be sharing will have um, it'll be PDF, so you would have to just search it up. But if you search up on YouTube, um, actually, if you search up Empathy for Kids, this isn't the only one that's there. There's some really great ones. I don't have slides in here, um, but in some other videos that I've done, we're talking specifically by grade about computer science. So um, I am working on a series of videos that are deeply going more deep into each grade um, computer science and how you can cover those in those videos. I go over an activity. I've been really successful with almost every level of, of students starting early elementary, actually right up to junior high. I do a STEAM activity where we, we watch a video about it. It's a uh, America's Got Talent video um, about a deaf girl who sings and it's very emotional and I would actually, I still, I've showed the video to classes um, many, many times and I still will cry every time I watch the video and it's really raw, but it's a way that when I step in front of them and they're all, you know, the video is very emotional, it sets the tone and then I step in front of them and I say, like, this is empathy rip, dripping down my face they make a connection to that immediately. And there's a there's a piece in the video you now where Simon hits the golden buzzer and the gold stuff falls from the ceiling. And so then we talk like right after we've watched the video about how did you feel? And then that's what empathy is. When you were happy for Mandy, that's the girl in the video. When you were happy for Mandy, that is empathy. And then my project goes on to have the students design some technology for this deaf girl who has to sing in her stocking feet because to pick up um, the rhythm of the music, she feels the vibrations through the floor. So then it turns into a really fun tech project where they're drawing pictures of shoes with no soles in the bottoms of them so she can still feel the floor right down to you know they're inventing technology that she can you know attach to herself that feel those vibrations in in another way and I can definitely uh, point you to that that and someone's familiar with the video too it's great and it's a really great way for teaching empathy um, and like I said even in junior high um just the impact of that and having them feel that in the moment. And then also allowing myself to be just a little bit vulnerable with the tears. It's a super good connection. And they always get excited about um, designing something for Mandy. And we actually have conversations because she has a degenerative um, disease. They can't actually fix her medical problems. So we talk about how what her issue is, is that she has to sing in her socks. It's not that she's deaf, because she has already solved that problem by figuring out how she can continue to sing while being deaf. But like she's going to be famous now and she can't go on stage in her stockings. And so that's sort of how I, I frame it to them. And like I said, I have, I save a lot of those because they're just so cool to see what people um, would design for her. So that's way longer than I intended to talk about empathy, though. I, I think it's a really important piece, as I said, not just to computer science and design thinking, but um, just generally for your students as well. So I'm going to just, um, no, oh, these ones aren't set to play. Perfect. So again, just working through this, I wouldn't go through this process with students unless I was at that grade five or six level. And I really wanted them to be diving deeply into the design thinking process. This is more just to get our minds around how we're doing these things. So defining, you know, using, this is where we're going to sit down and define our audience. So in my case of, of the deaf singer, well, she's a singer. She lost her hearing. Um, she's famous now because she was on, you know, America's Got Talent. She's very talented. And what, you know, so what do we know about her? We can watch that video and establish, we might, you know, look at how she dresses to determine what kind of shoes we're going to design for her and those kind of things. Anytime we're defining 
who someone is. So if we're talking in social studies about different members of the community and we're defining those people, we could be meeting this piece of the design process. Ideate, we do this all the time. Brainstorming is a huge piece of any type of learning and we, and it's happening a lot in the classrooms and so just drawing your attention to that that is a, a key central piece of the design process and if you are starting to use that language of, of design thinking with your students anytime you're doing brainstorming there's that chance to make that connection and say hey we just did part of the design process together didn't we because we were brainstorming ideas for what to do at recess or or whatever Prototyping and testing. I already talked a lot about that, that trial and error, getting students okay with failure, understanding that when I look at your piece of writing, even though I think it's amazing, I'm still going to tell you how you can improve it. And that's okay. It's good to go back to something and redo and make it better. And we might talk about how the Wright brothers weren't successful the first time they flew an airplane. Uh, in fact, they only had two unsuccessful attempts, which means they were pretty lucky as far as scientists go. But we generally need to be okay with making mistakes and understanding that if at first we don't succeed, um, just keep trying. This is a little video I like to show of some robot fails, again, specifically when I was doing robotics camps with students, and just to show them how, you know, failure can be funny. And again, that it's it's just okay. So that's design thinking, whether you're doing kindergarten, teaching grade four, five, six, whatever grades all along the way, you are probably already doing design thinking pieces of it with your class, encouraging them to do any of the pieces of this are just going to help when they get up to grade five and six and they're expected to get deeper into design thinking. Anything they've learned along the way is going to help them when they get there. This is a big one, uh, computational thinking. So that other key piece, we've got creativity, we talked about already. Second big idea in that organizing idea is design thinking. And finally, computational thinking. This is the one that most directly connects into what we know as computer coding or programming. So again, we didn't see, I think coding itself actually only came up one time um, throughout the whole computer science curriculum, maybe, maybe a couple of times. So we don't see that language. But as I said early on today, anytime you can use the computer language with the students, talking about algorithms, maybe starting to use some of this language from computational thinking, you aren't directly expected to instruct it. You're definitely not expected to assess it um, unless you're at the grade six level where abstraction is coming in. It, it's definitely something that can help you um, um, not only back off there. I'd completely lost the train of thought on that one. Um, it's not something necessarily, again, that you're explicitly teaching, but you are doing pieces of this and talking about how what we're doing can help us um, program computers or learn how to code or is like what engineers do when they're teaching computers things, just making those connections. And even though it's not explicitly a part of your curriculum, if you can include that computer language that's going to help your students out even more. So let's just break down these parts of computational thinking specifically. So again, uh, depending on whose site you land on when you Google, you might see um, some different pieces of computational thinking. I like this one. It's four short uh, pieces. They're fairly easy to understand. And I'm going to break this down uh, at the kindergarten level for all of us. So decomposition is the piece where we look at something and we want to break it down into its parts. So this might be a physical something like the peanut butter and jelly sandwich in the slide here. This is a really great concrete way to talk about the whole computational thinking piece with your students. And as I say, 
you might not say we're decomposing, but you may, you'll do the decomposing with your kindergarten class. So again, this can be like a physical thing like this. This may also be a problem that we're trying to solve. So whatever it is that we're looking at, decomposing is breaking it down into all of its parts and looking at what matters. So throughout a lot of the science organizing ideas, especially with the work that uh, I've seen Chris and Ted doing, there's a lot of talk about different types of sorts. So we might be using, you know, like Venn diagrams or we're sorting living and non-living. There's a lot of comparison in the science. And when you're doing those comparisons, let's say I'm looking at a whole bunch of um living things and we're deciding if they're plants or animals and I've I've given students you know cards or we're looking at pictures whatever it is and they're asked to sort um, out whether they're plants or they're animals we could have these conversations but well what are you looking at to make that decision and are there particular things that don't does the color of it matter if you're deciding if it's a plant or an animal, and then we can, and you might have, especially at the level, oh, well, green means plant. Hmm, I have a frog here. Does that put a frog in plants? Oh, no, that's not green. So when we are determining if something is a plant or an animal, does the color matter? No. Okay, well, we can throw color off to the side. What do we need to look at? And maybe we determine that whether it breathes. If it breathes, it's an animal. Okay, so that is a key attribute of that thing that we're looking at right now. So again, I'm probably not with, with young people going to say, students, let's decompose um, these animals or these, these living things. But we are doing that. And so then as we're moving up towards actually building algorithms. We're teaching kids how to take a big picture and break it down into all of its small parts. And then we're also teaching them how to ignore the parts that don't matter and to focus in on key pieces for what we need. That moves right into pattern recognition. So with my simple uh, example of the peanut butter and jelly sandwich here, um, I could ask the students, well, what can we, how can we group some of the, the pieces? So we've broken all the parts of our peanut butter and jelly sandwich down. Is there any way that we can like, you know, group them up together? And maybe we determine that some parts of this equation, you know, they need to be opened first. We can't use a jar of peanut butter if we haven't opened it. That's something that needs to be opened. And it also needs to be spread or, or and the bread needs to be open, but doesn't need to be spread. So just having conversations, again, peanut butter and jelly sandwich is a very simple um, concept that's not part of any of your curriculum, but it's a great way to just show you how this computational thinking works. So as we're doing, uh, making comparisons, we're finding attributes of those things that are the same. Now we're starting to look for pattern recognition. So we've sorted our plants and animals out. Now what's the same in all the animals? And again, we come down to, oh, they breathe, they have eyes. You know, what are the, the pieces that, that make it? And what, what do the plants have? Oh, they all have roots. And now we're looking for those patterns, what makes them the same. And then we can move into some abstraction where now we're taking those patterns, those rules, those groupings, and we're applying them to a new situation, or maybe we're bringing new things into our groupings. So, you know, can you think of any other things that you have to open before you can use them or eat them? And what about that you have to open and spread? And I just said eat, but as I glanced at my slide, we can have this, this talk about, so we've, we've been doing food. Are there other things that you spread that you don't eat? Oh, well, like the blanket on your bed. And is there anything else that needs to be open and you spread toothpaste on a toothbrush? So we're really taking, you know, the idea of a simple making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and applying it to other situations we could also ask students to come up with is there anything else that you could think of that we could take apart and figure out how to put it back together and probably with students again they're not going to think super outside the box but they're going to start to come up with ideas like other kinds of sandwiches maybe we get to like a sub or a pizza or a lasagna and we're talking about a lot of food things and eventually we could get out to um, connecting to other things that we can break down and put together like a peanut butter sandwich. So that's computational thinking um, in a very simple uh, way, talking about making a sandwich. 
Uh, but I hope that that helps you understand how you're doing these things um, with your students all of the time. And you don't have to explicitly have, you know, a computer science lesson where you're working on pattern abstraction in grade six. And that just making sure that you're using that language and talking about it and connecting to it any chance you can. And you're going to give the kids those skills too. So as I said, then ask them, you know, what are some other things that we could break down and come up with an algorithm or a set of instructions for? What do you think, kids? Do you think a robot could build a sandwich now with our instructions? Yes, I think that they can. And we've met all of those skills and procedures about designing instructions, interpreting instructions, and, and really getting deep into some of that critical computational thinking. Oh, wow, time's going so fast. So last piece of computational thinking is algorithm design, which I've already spent lots of time talking about uh, algorithms and how it's really just following instructions. So uh, there is not a very good algorithm for creating a peanut butter sandwich uh, just in the, the interests of saving real estate on my slide. Um, definitely, if I was doing this with a class, we would have a much longer, more um, explicit divined algorithm. But I just wanted to show this to you and then talk a little bit again we don't, we're just talking about instructions, especially in division one, um, seeing some coding and stuff in the upper grades, but it doesn't mean that you can't be including that, you know, computer language, talking about the algorithms a little bit more deeply. So when we're looking at something like this set of instructions, we could start to, um, you know, talk about this. I have an if, whoops, I have an if statement here. Um, that's a conditional statement in coding doesn't say anywhere in the computer science curriculum that your students need to know what conditional statements are. But I can tell you that they can't build something in block-based coding if they don't have somewhat of an understanding of what an if-then statement is. So again, are we expected to tell kindergarten kids this is a conditional statement? No, but it's really easy to work in if-thens with them. If the fire bell rings, then we all get up and get in the line and go outside. If you knock something over, then you pick it up. And so just a simple, you know, language change. Again, I don't have to use conditional statements with students. I would embed the language of if then statements early on. That's a key programming piece. And the other one that um, I haven't included in this algorithm specifically is the loops. And so if you can teach students about looping, which just means repeating something, right? And again, we can have those conversations about where in daily life do we repeat things to make it easier. And so, um, and I think it's probably about the grade four level of my deep dives on the computer science. I use lasagna as a as a computational thinking activity for students. And then the loop comes into that play because do you think we need to write out add meat, add noodles, add cheese? Is there some way we could, you know, make this shorter? Repeat four times, simple. Maybe I'm saying it is a loop, maybe I'm not, but I'm teaching students those things. And I'm going to next um, jump into showing you how whether you're kindergarten through grade six, you can give kids, I want to say, at least the first couple um, outcomes of computer science very easily with no tech. And as my mother would say, just two feet and a heartbeat. So I'm doing pretty good. I wanted to spend about the last half hour jumping into um, coding specifically. So we've talked about that organizing idea of computer science, how computational thinking, design thinking, and creativity are those three common threads that tie everything together all the way up through kindergarten and uh, from kindergarten through grade six. There are also three common threads that you can easily weave um, into your daily routines and your other classroom lessons. And then I would be remiss to not talk about coding at all. So I mentioned uh, very early on in the presentation that I was really excited about the computer science curriculum. I have been pushing teachers in Wetaskiwin Regional to teach coding to their students on top of everything else, 
even though it wasn't included anywhere in their curriculum. And we have um, been rolled, we've rolled out little robots and have come out as from the ed tech department to help launch those lessons because we really believe that learning to code is a key skill as important as learning to read or write or do math equations for our students. As I said early on, we know they're growing up into jobs that don't exist yet, using technology that like, let's be honest, that they are going to invent. And we want to give them a leg up in this future world that they're going to live in and helping them with some coding um, is going to definitely get them there. So this is my basic uh, intro to coding, good for any grade, good for adults too, to get a, a bit of an understanding of just what this is. So coding consists of many languages that computers understand. I've been doing STEAM stuff for 10 years. And in my initial slides, there was more than 250 coding languages. I have no idea how many there are today, but it would be just beyond that. So the goal in teaching students to code is that they would grow up and invent or design something, and they may even be one of the creators of another one of those languages. So different types of technology understand a different language. That's why your iPhone doesn't get along nicely with other tech and your Mac computer and Windows don't agree, right? They're different languages that are behind. They are all um, very similar. So learning one coding language makes it very easy to learn another coding language. And we are so fortunate to now live in a world where Brilliant engineers have created block-based coding, which is that puzzle piece type coding that anybody can do. You don't even have to be able to read yet to do coding. So it's very accessible. Um, we know it's a skill that our students are going to need in their futures. And it is actually really easy for you to start teaching the basics to even your littlest people. I like to get kids really excited about coding when we're talking about learning some programming, whether this be um, an unplugged coding project, which we're actually going to do one together here momentarily, whether we're working in Scratch, or I've brought in some little robots, I always start by talking with them about how amazing the world is, and how there is computer programming in literally everything that we touch these days. So this getting them a little bit excited about you know, what computer programming means. They may really directly connect it to video gaming. A lot of the block-based programming things that students might have already done would be very game-based. So just drawing their attention to that programming is a practical part of everyday life. And that basically learning to program means you're going to be able to tell all of these different things what to do and almost be like work magic if you can tell technology what to do and understand its language. And I will pull robots out specifically and talk about that second. So we saw the smart devices and things that's like really user friendly, what we're seeing every day in life. And then I really like to always connect in robots for my students. Again, this robots don't pop up in your curriculum anywhere. However, they are an easily identifiable thing that is programmed. We can make that connection to, you know, my, my students being my little bots, similar to these other bots. When I talk to students about robots, my key piece with this slide um, is that we will draw attention to, you know, the toys. There's a Lego Mindstorms in the middle here um, and another sort of humanoid looking toy. But then I'll start to explain to them that, that while robots can be really fun and they can be like toys, they actually serve really important jobs. And so like that big guy spinning around, that's a police robot. They put him on the streets in big cities where it's not safe for real humans to be walking around in the streets. And he's directly connected to a police officer back at the station. So, you know, people can get help from this robot to like to a real human. And then we have, you know, Da Vinci. Here is the surgery robot, which allows really talented doctors to operate on parts of the body they could never operate on before. And what kind of doctors do you think get to use the Da Vinci? They have to be a really good doctor. And they have to have some technology skills. They might even know some computer programming. So no matter what you want to be, if you know how to computer program, you're going to be more wanted for your job and you're going to be better at it.
I'm going to have sound on this one. I think um, if you're my age or older, you probably might think that programming looks a little bit like this. Although admittedly, uh, I am more familiar than this with it now. And I know that it's nothing um, nearly as elusive or complicated. In fact, it is the most simple of things. It's as I've been talking at length about for the last um, hour, it really is about just putting a set of instructions together, have this simple toothbrushing. I could have these little cards cut out, ask the students to put this in the right order and boom, we wrote a code. And when I do that with, with, with students, if I have them sort something or we do the, the physical activity that I'm about to do with you guys, um, when we're done and I say, well, now you're all computer programmers because you just wrote a program and actually kids and adults alike, because I've had the pleasure to do some PD with teachers as well on this and even some administrators, um, even adults are pretty excited when you say, hey, you're a computer programmer now. And they realize all they really did was, you know, put some instructions together. I've got a little bit of vocab here. So I've, I've made reference, I think, to some of these throughout the presentation. I don't, I think if kids at whatever age know these five terms, adults also, you are ready to jump in and start definitely some block-based programming. I have talked at length about algorithms. I mentioned the loop earlier. That's, you know, a repeat. Uh, and then we have a little bit more specific stuff. This might be more for grade four and up when we're actually getting into some block-based programming. Although I'd highly encourage you even at a, at a kindergarten grade, if you have the ability to have some little robots in your classroom, something like B-Bots, where the kids are, you know, punching in those algorithms and doing activities with them, then you could definitely be including this other language too. So the event, that is the, when the fire bell rings. That's our event. That's what starts that algorithm. And then input, that's the instructions. Output, that's what happens. Pretty simple and straightforward. So again, just a language thing. So kid bots, what's the input for snack time? And they all say, putting your hand up like this or turning the lights off or the bell goes. And what's the output? Um, we all go do whatever. That's simple language that you can include. Um, and then when you're doing an activity, something like this. So I don't have my handy dandy remote with me. So I will have to pretend. I will just assume you're all participating. Um, so this is a chance to move a little bit, but this is also something you can just take back and do with your students. It's really fun and easy way to introduce what computer coding is to any age. So I would start out by saying, so students, we've all learned what an algorithm is. I am now going to program you to do something. So the first piece of programming is, I'm gonna have to teach you your language because you guys don't know your language yet. And we're gonna go with a really simple language. I have my handy imaginary remote. When I point my remote at you and press my button, that's going to be your indication to start your algorithm when we get there. So let's have a look at the pieces of your language. So the first part of your language is when you see the letter R, I want you to stomp your right foot hard once on the floor. Stomp. And I'm sure you could guess that the second piece of your language is when you see the letter L to stomp your left foot on the floor. Continuing right along, when you see an H, that is a sign for you to clap your hands together. Now, when I'm doing this activity with students, of course, students are little people and they're going to probably be silly. And I want them to be when I'm teaching this activity. So I've taught you your language. Now, here's your first algorithm. Now, I'm going to give you a second to look at it so you know what you're doing. And remember, you don't start until you see me push my magic remote. Now, inevitably, if you do this activity with students, uh, I've had the opportunity to do it live and virtual like I am with you. And um, when you do it with students, as soon as you throw this slide up, they're going to start, they're gonna do their thing. 
and you, you'll have to remind them. But again, like, so you're having fun and you're actually teaching the kids something, but at the back of that is you're like embedding that computate, that, that coding thing. Remember an algorithm can't start without an event. So now when I get up to grade six and I'm doing some block-based programming, I know I always need to pull out that on start button because there has to be something that starts the algorithm. So friendly reminder, don't start your algorithm, my bots, until you see my magic me push the magic button. And then, you know, I'd push the magic button and we're going to go through this algorithm. And great, great job. Let's try another one. So, and we're going to work through and we're going to be silly and, and we're going to remind them not to stomp on each other's feet. This, I had the kids get up. I find lots of times that this, just like with you guys, um, I've been talking for a long time. They've been sitting, they're getting restless. So I will ask them to stand for this, though. If you have a busy class, uh, they can certainly do this one sitting as well. So then we just run through, you know, a couple practices and we should be seeing that everybody's and Actually, one I forgot to mention is inevitably when you show it to them, some of them will go. And we'll have to say, oh, it means clap one time. What would we have to see if we were going to clap a bunch of times? Well, we'd see a bunch of H's. So we can have those conversations. It's definitely going to go slower with little people than it does um, with me today. And then we're getting into just some more complicated algorithms. Okay, you guys, start. And at some point, probably I'd stop, you know, doing them with and just they're doing it themselves. You guys, look at you go. You are awesome little bots. All right, we're going to learn something new now. In coding, there is something called a loop. This is how we can tell you to do something over and over and over again. So let's look at this. Notice this number three here. This means you're going to do what's inside three times. Don't forget, you're not going to do that until I push my special button. So then we push the special button and we stomp up three times. Good job. You just learned what a loop is. So easy. Let's test your knowledge now and see. So now we've got a forever loop. A forever loop means you just keep on doing that forever. Let's start. And then now we've got everybody and I'm going to wait until they start to look like how long are we supposed to do this for? And then I'm going to tell them, wait, we need another kind of event. So we know that an algorithm has to be started with an event. Well, sometimes we need another event to stop an algorithm. Everybody stop, right? So now when I see the stop button, now I know that means I'm going to stop whatever loop that I'm trapped in. And then finally, we're just going to pull it all together and we're going to test that y'all can do this and I get this up and everybody's good now they know not just they're just waiting for me to push the button on the remote and push the button on the remote and everybody starts doing their thing and if all goes well fairly shortly oh my video is not going to play you can um, start belting out we will rock you or um, throw a video up on but that is a loop for stomp, stomp, clap, stomp, stomp, clap. The kids might not get the song reference. The teachers at teachers convention loved it. Um, and then this is the point. I so As I said, my video didn't play. It's probably not legal. Um, but play the song. We will rock you. Maybe sing it. Talk about that. And then we would have a conversation about, did you guys notice how y'all got in sync with each other and they will i mean i hope they will maybe your kindergartens won't um definitely in a room full of adults uh, when we started you know and everybody was initially even the adults were just like focused on what they were supposed to be doing you know and then as they sort of became aware of what was going on in the room around them everybody synced up and i had a room full of 100 plus teachers you know giving me the the lead in for the song and then so we have a conversation so do you think that if i had a room full of robots and just like you guys they all started at just a fraction of a second different times would the robots have all gotten in sync with each other 
And the answer, of course, is no, they wouldn't have because robots don't have powerful sentient brains like humans. So as humans, um, we are able to do things beyond what I programmed you. And you didn't even realize you were doing it. But as you were performing your algorithm, you were also listening to all the other robots around you. And it made sense for all of your brains to get in sync with each other. And that is why robots will never take over the world and why you really want to learn how to speak the language that they speak because a machine, a robot, any type of technology is powerless without a powerful human mind to give it those instructions. And that's you know, sort of my last piece, I when I come into little kids, uh, it's always fun. In particular, I work, our, we have some very rural areas in our division where um, I'll meet a lot of, no, robots are bad. They're taking people's jobs and, and you know, those sorts of conversations. So this is one of those pieces I always touch on, really draw attention to. Robots are amazing. Computers are so powerful and so smart but not as smart as the people who made them and wrote those programs. So I will touch on that always. And then again, just as a reminder that, you know, instructions need to be really, really specific when we give them to a machine. We're lucky that when we give instructions to humans, most often if there's an error in our instructions or something doesn't make sense, um, humans will figure it out. Like for example, uh, this, activity didn't have us moving around. I will also do an activity with students very similar where I throw the slides up, I give them their arrows, you know, when right arrow means one step to the right and a left arrow is one step to the left. In this case, I actually teach them the box step, which I don't think students are really learning anymore these days. Um, so they learn to dance on that one too. But that one's fun because what happens is they're um, standing just in space at their desks and inevitably they run into each other, their desk, a chair. They can't actually, you know, perform the motions that I've asked them to do. And again, I'll say, how many of you bumped into your desk? And, you know, the hand, and what did you do? Well, I moved over to the side or I did, I adjusted. And so then again, there's that conversation about, so a robot would have just kept bumping into the desk. You know how your computer, hmm, arrow, it, error, it can't figure out. It's just going to sit there and spin now as a human, your powerful sentient mind went, hmm, I'm bumping into something. I need to move out of the way. And of course, we can teach robots to do that too, but when we're really just doing basic algorithm design, that's a really simple way to show the difference between a program that a machine completes compared to we are doing this as humans, but there's always that piece where we are different because we are able to think. We won't talk about if and when robots are able to think because we know that is what they're working on too. And then of course, once all our fun and play with the stomp, stomp, clap, and we will rock you, um, I may need to throw my big giant stop button up to get it all to stop too. Oh, where are we at? 9.48, wow. So um, that was a no tech way, a fun way that you can institute some programming into your classroom quickly and easily. Somebody had mentioned I saw about robots in the gym earlier. Don't be afraid to do kid bots in the gym too. There's some great ways that you could connect in. So, you know, using hand signals for your warm up routine, um, just switch it up a little bit, coming into the gym in the morning every day coming in, we know this hand signal means this and some other signals for different types of warm ups. Each gym class, you know, you throw out those hand signals in a different order um, and give them to them as an algorithm, right? So not everybody go run 10 laps, then everybody's done. Okay, now we're all going to do some stretching. This is this would be you're going to give them those say three. So you give them the three hand signals and they know that means run 10 laps, stretch our legs, stretch our arms. And I'm embedding computer science, algorithmic thinking, computational thinking right into those classroom activities. Anytime you are doing some type of motion, if you can use arrows, moving little characters around on an old checkers board, if you've got like floor tiles in your classrooms, those make perfect um, 
you know, spaces for moving one square. Give me an algorithm for how to get to the light switch using the tiles on the floor. Oh, move forward six times, turn right. We can have those conversations about um, that. That's on the next slide. Oh, next slide. So these little activities are all included. These are just, this is just really simple. Um, it could be a digital activity like this. Again, as I say, anything squares, little figurines, we're moving them around. So like in this example, how does the smiley face get to the sun without hitting the cloud or the lightning bolt? Can you put the arrows in order? Can you give me those steps in order? And we are creating instructions, interpreting instructions and working in that computational thinking. This is a, a key piece, particularly if you're going to have little robots in your classroom or when you're starting to do, if you're coding a human and you're having them move around in space, we have a spot where we will move from the arrows that we saw on the last slide towards this. So in the last slide, we had the side to side, right? This is like presuming that I don't ever turn in space, that I'm going to move around like this. Well, in coding, programming, actually using robotics, we have to actually work in turns. So that's actually a key piece that in like kindergarten, grade one, if you have something like B-Bots, you're going to be doing these. Do they move that way when you push the side button or do they turn that way when you push the side button? And we have to talk about how the turn is actually one of those instructions in the algorithm. That's a little piece that you can build easily with just activities like this are also, as I say, some little robots really running. Yes, mapping. Oh, absolutely. You could do so much with mapping and creating algorithms. So as I said, toys, floor tiles, old checkerboards. I bet you if you reached out to your parent body, you would find that people had some old checkerboards, chessboards and things laying around that have no use because all of the little pieces are missing, but they would be just fabulous for practicing coding skills with your students. Um, depending what grade you're at, Sudoku is a great uh, algorithmic thinking, computational thinking activity, just have some that could be like a center or a free time fast finisher activity you have for your students. It's going to work on those computational thinking skills. Um, coding a drawing, if you've ever done this, that's fun. Ask students to tell you how to draw a house. And uh, we're the, the, it's most fun if you do it um, with yourself as a teacher for the first time. And the house is a great one. And, you know, they tell you to draw a straight line and draw another straight line and you intentionally do a bad job. And the whole point is to get them to really explain to you those specific instructions. They could then move into coding a drawing. You know, I write out the instructions, give it to a friend, see what they come out with. Does their drawing look anything like what I asked them to draw? That's all, again, doing those algorithm design and doing computational thinking, asking them to Write a program for a computer to do an adding problem. What are the steps that it would take? You can do those things. I spy and guessing games are really great computational thinking activities, coding a friend or a family member and following hand signals and actions. I mentioned that there are some great websites. So code.org has activities starting right at the low grades. If you have some Chromebooks available and you want to do some things on some tech Oh, I see the comment about the water cycle. In my grade three session, I've got a really great scratch project about water cycle. Uh, so Tinker, if you have access to Minecraft Education Edition in your division, there's some coding in there. CS first, um, and then I mentioned Scratch quite a bit too. So I have quite a few Scratch activities that you will see coming up onto the resources at the ARPDC site uh, as we're moving through the next few months. I'm working on connecting at least one good Scratch activity for all those units in grade four through six. So do watch for those. And finally, um, just some physical things. I've mentioned little robots, so you may be able to use some, some curriculum money to buy something. Maybe your school already has something or you have a way to get some resources. If you don't already know that our ATA library has a whole bunch of resources that you can borrow, it's really easy. Just call them up. They'll ship them out to you and you can ship them back. I highly recommend checking some of those out, particularly if you haven't bought any robots yet. I like B-Bots. I like Code and Go Robot Mouths. Um, you can find these guys on Amazon. And we also like the Botleys here.
Alrighty. Well, I've got about six minutes left. Do we have any questions? I've got a few questions that I've collected from the chat. Angela, I'll maybe share those with you right now. Alrighty. Where did they go? Um, now, one of the questions was just um, um, sharing some ideas on educational robots. You've just done that. As mm -hmm. the person asked that question, I suppose uh, if you have another question, maybe you could open your mic and ask, ask now. Um, did Angela answer that question about types of robots you may be able to find? 